things. Um, the first thing was a generalization of the beta Bernoulli model. And this is a generalization that allows us to deal with more than just two classes. So we, could, you know, we can do k classes. Uh, for a die, for example, you would do k plus c classes. So can you turn your microphone on? Thank you. How's that? Thanks. So when we have multiple classes, um, say k classes, uh, the, the extension of the Bernoulli is this distribution that I call the categorical distribution, uh, which is essentially um, uh, this guy over here. That's the categorical distribution. And the natural extension to uh, uh, vectors of the, with, with more values of the uh, beta distribution is what we call the Dirichlet distribution. And we learned that if we multiply the Dirichlet distribution times a categorical distribution and normalize, we get a Dirichlet distribution. So Dirichlet prior, categorical likelihood, Dirichlet posterior. Now, if you're dealing with words, words are essentially counts. Uh, when, when we deal with text, we always think of words we always think of what words have occurred in a document. So essentially we're counting. We're dealing with, uh, uh, with coins, basically. We accept that we have many coins. One coin for each word. Is this word present or not? And the same as when we, do, uh, de when we deal with bioinformatics and we need to de deal with DNA, where we're looking at do we, have a, do we have an A, do we have a D, do we have a T, which, ba which DNA basis? Uh, uh, are we dealing with here? So uh, these type of models extremely useful in bioinformatics and extremely useful for um, web information mining, text analytics, and the like. Any any sort of discrete quantities. Um, we began with an example, and this example was the one of uh, tweets. And so what we wanted to do, what we want to do is a tweet classifier. We want to say whether a tweet is positive or negative. And so we decided that the way we were going to code the input is just as a vector, x, and this vector has a one if the word appears in the corresponding component, and it will have a zero otherwise. So this vector will tend to be mostly zeros, and will have say. I don't know how many words typically appear in a tweet, maybe five to ten uh, ones in the vector. Okay, so it's a very sparse vector. You just basically store the positions of the ones. And then we might want to classify the tweets into two classes, positive or negative, um, or three classes, positive, negative, neutral, or any other number of classes that you might want to choose. Um, positive, negative is easy because one way to get labeled data from Twitter, and there's many ways, but one possible hack is you look for all the tweets that have a happy face and you call them positive, and you look for all the tweets that have an unhappy face and you call them negative. Of course, in those there will be mistakes because, you know, sarcasm and so on. But fortunately, by popularity, uh, you know, with high probability, most of the tweets with happy faces will be uh, happy. And so in the end, when we build our classifier, there's going to be mistakes in the data. There are very good techniques to deal with these mistakes in the data, which would, what, what we call outliers. Um, but I'm not going to cover them in this course. I'm happy to talk to you after. Um, but it, it will turn out that even if we allow for a certain margin of error, we're already uh, able to actually come up with uh, very good classifiers. In fact, this particular site called Sentiment140, which you can, you can go to this site and you can type any term. Um, and you, so the way it works is like you go to the site, you type Obama, it then extracts a bunch of all the recent tweets about Obama, and then it applies the classifier to each tweet. So it's just prediction. So you first train in a million tweets. Then for any query, you just basically predict what each tweet is in terms of how whether it's positive or negative, and then you just count the number of positive tweets about Obama, the number of negatives, and, and that's pretty much what you see there in those two bars. So when I did this two days ago, um, the sentiment in Twitter for Obama before the election was quite positive. 
Um, fairly sure you could have used this to predict the result of the election. Um, the pardon? The positive is even higher now. <laughs> yeah, the positive might be higher now. Um, the important thing though is like with statistical analysis actually if you look at a lot of uh, indicators out there and this is actually I might as well use the election to preach on something. Um, if you looked at all the economic indicators a few days before the election it was you could make a fairly reasonable forecast of what the outcome was going to be. And then there were the so-called pundits and so in particular, I recommend a blog by a guy called Nate Silver in the New York Times um, who did some statistical analysis based on historical data. And if, if, if the historical data is to be believed, if it's good data, then you can make some good forecasts. They will not be 100% accurate because we've learned one thing. Probability is important. The world's very uncertain. You don't measure everything. Um, but it's certainly better than just saying, this guy will win because he happens to, I can see the glimmer in his eye. <laughs> it might be that if you do a proper analysis with Lasso, the one variable is the glimmer in the eye, but at least you've done that analysis. Um, okay, so, so statistics is very useful. And indeed, it's even in you know, things like this election, they played a big important role. Um, like I believe that both parties were getting all the census data of the U.S. citizens and using that data to actually forecast how they were going to vote. And then they would only, because if you know the people that would vote for you, you, appro you approach them to ask them to vote if they haven't voted. You don't approach the people of the other party and ask them to vote. All right. Now, in order to make a classification, we're going to go from a prior probability of a classes. Go ahead. So two things with the current representation of the tweet. One, that it's not considering the frequency of the terms, like how many times a particular word occurs. That's correct. So, so yeah, that's a very good point. Um, here, if, if someone says, uh, like, Obama, 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 Obama. It's all you get is a one Obama. Okay, so you don't get a frequency of three. So if we make uh, instead of having multivariate Bernoulli, if you have multivariate uh, categorical. That's correct. Would it so, not be better? Um, no, one can do that. They, they actually work about the same in practice. Okay, so this book actually discusses that particular topic, compares different models. We could do the naive classifier with that model. Yeah. Um, I could take that route, and it would be very similar, the, the derivation and so on. But like performance-wise? Uh, Not really. This actually works pretty well, this binary one. Uh, like the issue which I see is that if you use naive base for a text document, it's OK. But since the tweets are so small, the frequency and the order in which words occur do Right. Not there are several arguments. I'm not going to have time to go into them, but I will discuss this with you at the end. Um, there's arguments in favor and against um, using this model versus a multinomial model. Let, let's talk about it. I first want to do one before we start discussing all the possibilities of what other models we could do. No, it's a good point. Um, I don't know. Pick one randomly. or. That's a detail of how you construct your data. I don't know, pick one randomly or, or construct two. At that stage, you might even consider not using that data point because that data point is probably just going to add noise to your data. Okay. There's a, a way of also making the data cleaner is uh, we have lists of like 8,000 words, 4,000 of which are the words that tend to be positive, like extraordinary, fantastic, awesome, so cool, um, OMG, exclamation mark, and so on. And we also have uh, words that are negative, and then you could use that to just sort of protect you a bit against sarcasm and so on to improve the quality of the data. 
But ultimately, um, what we need to do here is a robust analysis, which is we need to have techniques that are robust with respect to outliers. I have not talked about that topic um, yet. So for now, let's assume that someone gave us data of happy faces and sad faces, and, and that's the data we have to work with. And just with that data, I can tell you, you can build something like this, which is pretty good. So we will get it wrong. Um, the trick here is that um, in how many tweets did this retrieve? This retrieved about 40, say 60 tweets. And it probably got it wrong um, in 10 of those. Um, but the main thing is if you, if once, if the signal is very obvious, even if you get it wrong, even if you have the prediction wrong in a few tweets, it doesn't matter because you want to predict the sentiment about Obama and you have lots of tweets about Obama to make that prediction. So if you get it, you're not trying to predict, your interest is not in a single tweet, your interest is in an aggregate. So even if you make a few mistakes when you average, uh, those mistakes will hurt you less. They will still affect the index. You of course want zero mistakes, but um, one thing I'm hoping you start getting from this course is getting zero mistakes is impossible in most applications. Is there any kind of evaluation for this kind of classification? Yeah, you collect more data of happy faces and sad faces, and that's your test set. Oh, okay. But there's no way to like, say that this prediction is wrong and be able to, you know, to go and readjust Well, you do get it. You build more data sets with happy faces, and you see how well the, the, the model that you learn in the training data is able to predict the test set. And you adjust your regularization coefficients and so on. And then you eventually um, uh, take yet another data set and make sure that you validate the model. And ultimately, you create a product like this and you put it out there online. And if it's a good product, people will use it. <laughs> I think that's eventually a usability test, whether you've done something useful. Well, like for something like this, we don't have any user feedback. Okay, there's no feedback. Oh, true. That, that's a good point. So if I was designing this website, I would probably have put a button there that would say agree, disagree with this that. decision. So there you go. This was a cut and paste. And, and that sort of feedback would help you improve because then you get labeled date. But of course, the moment you put buttons agree, disagree, trust me, there's going to be a million spammers and a million um, uh, people that, that just for the fun of it will try to break your system. So it's no. <laughs> Whenever you build a website, a product, the first thing you need to do is be protected against malicious attacks. That's essential. They happen the first day you become popular. And if you're building a search engine, the first thing you need to deal with is spam and pornography. <laughs> All right, so uh, we're going to stick with this idea that we're going to have uh, the, the x's are going to be model is going to be a vectors one and zeros. Each entry of that vector x is a coin flip. It's either one or zero, so it's a Bernoulli variable. And we're going to assume that those words are independent. That's a naive base assumption. That, um, that's why it's called naive, because we're just assuming all of those words to be independent. So we have, in this case, small d independent binary variables. Okay? So small d is the number of um, distinct words. N is the number of tweets, the number of data. So it's important to keep this in mind. And C will be the number of classes. OK. So what we want to do then is we start, is we want to derive the posterior, this quantity here, which is the posterior probability of the class given as input the tweet x. OK, what's the probability of y ranges of a positive and negative is binary. And then x is that vector of many, you know, small d Bernoulli variables. 
a priori, and then you, we can just simply apply here, um, we, we, we can factorize this with, as a joint divided by a marginal, or apply base rule uh, effectively, and the, we have this quantity P of Y I given pi, which is the, the prior probability of each class. So a priori, how positive, what's, what's your prior on positiveness and what's your prior negativeness? of tweets. And I will model that prior with a Dirichlet, sorry, uh, there will be a Dirichlet prior on this prior, um, but uh, the prior itself, uh, uh, this P of YI given pi is a, is a categorical distribution. So the probability that you are of class C, in, in our case we have uh, capital C is 2 and then for C equal 1 and uh, we are positive tweets and then for C equal 2 we have negative tweets. And so we said that the probability of you being in class C is just pi C. And so if you have a multinomial um, this just is a summary of this. Tweets anymore? Pardon? Are we not allowing neutral tweets? A like glass class, you talked about allowing tweets that are neutral. Um, I've, yeah, I deleted neutral All right. for, for simplicity. In essence, we're back to. Uh, like yeah, let, let's get. Let's, this was an example. You, let's now assume that C equal to, in this example, positive and negative. The other thing is this vector, i is the index of a tweet. So the, for the i tweet, we have D word, possible words. So the ith tweet, the prior probability of the words in the ith tweet is going to be a product over all distinct words in the dictionary of the probability of that variable. Okay? So we're just saying it's n, sorry, small d independent Bernoulli variables. And each of these guys will be a Bernoulli variable. And then what we hope is for different classes we will have different Bernoulli variables. So these might be over here, this is for class y equal 1, and this is for class y equal 2. And so you might have different, different coins being tossed with different frequency for different classes and that's what's going to allow us to separate. So in some classes you'll see more words like Viagra and special and for other words you'll see other words like midterm, homework and so on. And that's what's going to allow us to separate say spam from this, by the way, is how you build a spam classifier to naive basis, the typical easy way to build a spam classifier. All right, so lastly, um, so we, I wrote the, the full expression for the model. Um, so, and I promised that I was going to parse it. So we know that P of Y given pi is equal to the product over the data the product over from 1 to n, the product over classes of pi c, oops, <coughs> pi c to the power pi c y i. And this is just basically saying equivalently that the probability of yi being equal to c even pi is what I'm calling pi c. Okay, because when yi happens to be equal to c, it will it'll be equal to c. It will not be equal to any other. If yi is equal to 2, it will not be equal to 1. And so this indicator just like for the Bernoulli, we'll only choose one of the pies, one of the components.
and we're assuming that we have C independent ones, C independent classes, and we're assuming that the data the data are independent. So each tweet is independent of other tweets, which is also again a stark assumption because tweets often the tweets that you see coming one after the other do have a certain dependency. But we will we will throw away all these uh, complications and we'll assu assume that everything is nicely independent. Um, finally, I'm going to say that the probability of xij given, given the fact that the class, that the ice tweet is of class C and given its parameters is going to be a Bernoulli variable and if it's a Bernoulli variable it's going to have be this guy. So it will have theta jc which is the probability of x i uh, j being equal to 1 and that happens when y i is equal to is of class c and <coughs> x i j is 1 and then the probability of failure y i is still of class c but x i j is of class zero. Okay, so we're saying we have given that you're in a particular class so we've selected y equal to c to indicate we are now in class c so that's why we need to put that indicator in both terms but given that we are in class c assuming we are in class c we could still the word could be on or off the word Viagra could be on or off and so we need uh, we have a Bernoulli model Go ahead. just explain what the J index is for again mm -hmm. sure so we have a vector X so an a, a tweet will be a vector of Uh, words. It's a vector that just basically has a 1 if a word occurs and a 0 otherwise. And each position indicates a particular word. And this goes from i equal 1 to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 uh, all the way up to i equal d which in this case is 8. So it's a number of components of the vector xi. Each entry of the vector xi is Bernoulli. You mean j, right? J. Oh, yes. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. j is the index from 1 to 2. And that's for the ice tweet. And then for the ice tweet, I also have that yi is equal to um, 1 or 2. Okay. In other words, class 1 or class 2. Instead of saying class 1, class 2, I just say class C in order to make the derivation generic. Okay, so I is the index of the data. I goes from 1 to n. J is the index of a word features. It goes from 1 to d. And C is the index of a classes. It goes from 1 to capital C and, and for the positive negative capital C is 2. Okay. And so we have n observations, IID, so we take the product over n. And um, since we have C classes, we use a categorical distribution for C classes. So in other words, we're binning into class 1 or class 2. I could have used a Bernoulli model here because we only have two classes and that would have simplified it. But I'm, making some, I'm doing something more general because if I tomorrow ask you to do in your homework, implement it for three classes, including neutral, then you would know how to do it. You would go from one to three in that case. Capital C would be three. And then we have this quantity, theta jc, which is just a probability 
that the jth element of the vector x i is on when you are in class C that's what the subindex indicates okay. so theta j c is just a probability that in the positive class the word fabulous appears and each class will have a different distribution so each of these guys is essentially uh, like each of these lines is basically your theta uh, ij sorry theta j when c equal 1 and this will be a, a particular theta j when c is equal to 2 for class 2, y equal to 2. So for each class you have many of these thetas and in particular you have d of these thetas because there are d words, each word gets its own theta. Each word has a success probability of being on or off and what's going to allow us to separate one class from another one is that these classes when you consider all the words they will have different distributions. Okay, spam tends to have words like Viagra and great offer, super deal, etc. Whereas normal mail, I guess, like a professor will have things like a deadline, assignment, and so on. So theta JCs, are they determined by maximum likelihood estimate or are they too determined by Bayesian estimate? We're about to derive that. Okay. Once we, you know, the, the, the tricky thing here with these models is to just keep track of the three indices and to know what are we doing, how are we binning everything. Once we know that, this is essentially like Bernoulli models. Um, once we know that, doing maximum likelihood is actually quite easy and we'll get to it. Um, so in particular, I'm going to do the following thing. I'm going to define, so n is the number of data points. I'm going to introduce yet two more indices, two, two more summaries. Uh, one is going to be the number of points of class C. In other words, the number of positive tweets and the number of negative tweets. So NC is just the sum over all the tweets and you count how many times Y was of class C. We're also going to count the number of times the tweets were of class C and a particular word was on. So how many times did the word Viagra occur in the positive class? and how many times did the word Viagra occur in the negative class. That's NJC. Now, if you wanted to guess Pi C, okay, which is just a probability that you, that you will be of class C, the pro, what's, what do you think would be? The probability that a tweet will be positive or negative. What would be sort of an estimate for it? Exactly. You would expect this to be NC divided by N. Okay? You know, let's just use our intuition. The number, the number of tweets positive will be the total number of tweets. Um, I guess I was using a, a small N for that, so let me make sure. Okay. Likewise, given that you're in class C, what do you think is a good estimate for the probability of a word being on? In GC upon NC. Exactly. Okay. Number of times the word J appears in class C divided by the number of times words are, you know, number of tweets in class C. We will derive these. But first I wanted to start with some intuition. If we want to make predictions, let's assume we've got these estimates. Once you have these estimates, you're done. You've, and this will be the maximum likelihood estimates, by the way, sort of ruin the surprise. Um, and then when you want to do a prediction, you use precisely the model that we wrote. So our model is this product of these pi c's and then the, these 
small d Bernoulli variables, and that's precisely what I'm going to do. So given a new data point x star, the way I'm going to predict if it's of class C, whether it's positive or negative, is I'm just going to multiply the prior of the class times, um, you know, Bernoulli for each of the d components of that vector x star. So I evaluate the model, and I only need to evaluate it up to proportionality, right? Because I only have two classes, positive and negative. So I compute each, and then I just divide by their sum. And that, that gives me the probability that the tweet is positive and the probability that the tweet is negative, and that's how we're going to do predictions. We're going to have probabilistic predictions on these tweets. Okay? So it's just evaluating the model. Okay, this expression here is the same as expression I had before. I'm just now going to assume I am of class C, so I set this to 1, and then I just have the estimate theta jc to the power of um, whether the word is on or off. So it's just evaluating the probability of a Bernoulli distribution. That gives us a prediction, and we're done. That's how we make prediction. So that search engine that I showed to you, every time you type a word, it applies this equation to each of those tweets. And then it sums the number of positive or the number of the negative. Or maybe it sums the total pro positive probability and the total negative probability. And that's how you get a sentiment for the tweets. Of course, you could do this. This is actually quite useful because if you're in market research and you launch a new product, you want to know how people are talking about your product in Twitter. And you would want to do this. The algorithm, dead simple. Right? Because all we have to do is count. So we just loop and we count the number of times uh, you estimate basically pi c and theta jc, which are just counts. So I'll let you at home parse the algorithm. In fact, I'm going to ask you to implement this. There's only one warning. I'm multiplying many probabilities. Now, probabilities are numbers between 0 and 1. When we deal with millions of tweets, and possibly millions of words, you're going to be multiplying millions of small numbers. Now, computers are not analog, at least not the ones that we use, mostly. And uh, because of that, when you multiply many small numbers, you're going to get zero. And, and that's because the machines are rounding off. They're, under, they're, they're going through underflow. This is a problem when you invert matrices as well. A few people during the exam actually asked me, what is numerical stability? Well, often, if you don't add that small, rich element to the diagonal, what happens is the numbers are very small, and they're small below machine precision. So you put a zero in, in the matrix as one of the eigenvalues. And if you try to invert 1 divided by 0, you get infinity, and the wave machines often react to that as they stop working. <laughs> they hang out, or some will gracefully give you a message not to do something stupid. Um, but numerical precision is something we need to contend with. I'm not going to go through the details of this, and I'm going to let the TAs teach you this trick. But if you have, let, let me give you just the intuition here as an example. If you have to take the log of the sum of two very tiny numbers, in other words, you're multiplying two tiny numbers. Okay, so if you're multiplying two tiny numbers, you, you, um, you exponentiate them so that you can factor them out and then you take the log because the log is inverse of the um, exponentiation property, so you still have the right thing. But what you can do instead is you can write it in log um, e form. You then take the a common factor, and then you take the log of that common factor, 
out. And now you just need to deal with uh, exponentiating like bigger terms, e to the zero, which is one, e to the minus one, which is one over 2.7. So it's a very useful trick to deal with underflow. Um, I don't want to go over these tedious details on how you do it. Um, there's code here in the slides which will be available to you as to how you would implement this trick. This here is called the log sum exp function. And then the code is there to tell you how to do it. The TAs will help you with that so that you can finish your homework. If you don't do this trick, um, it will not work. Your code will not handle the, we, I'm, we're going to give you a million tweets for you to train this. And if you don't do that smartly, the code will not work. Okay, so you do need to use these tricks. They're also very good interview questions, by the way. If you ever want to apply for a text analytics company, chances are this is actually a very nice question to ask, how to deal with underflows with multinomials. Okay, uh, the maximum likelihood estimate. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to rewrite this as the product from C equal 1 to C. And then I'm going to take pi C to the NC times the product from J equal 1 to D of theta j c and j c one minus theta j c and c minus n j c. Okay. What I'm doing there is the same trick that I did with the Bernoulli distribution in detail before, which is if I multiply, I'll do it with one term. If I have the product over i and the product over c of pi c to i c of y i, that's equal to the product over c of pi c to the sum over i of the indicator there. So I'm using the same operation that we use all the time. If you're multiplying the same term to an exponent, you just take that term to the sum of the exponents. In other words, um, 2 to the 3 times 2 to the 4 is equal to 2 to the 3 plus 4. That's the property that I'm using. But once I use this property, I get an expression that's a bit more condensed. And the sum over those two indicators was the definition of NJC. Now, once I have it in this form, the log likelihood of the parameters, which in this case are theta and pi, I just uh, sum of a C equal 1 to capital C, and C log of pi C. And then I'm going to put it separately as two terms. So there's this term, and then there's going to be the sum of a C equal 1 to NC, and the sum of a J equal 1 to D of NJC log theta JC plus NC minus NJC log of 1 minus theta jc. One more. Okay, so that's my log likelihood. It's just taking. So from now on, it's all mechanical. There's a lot more indices than we had with the coin model, but what I'm doing is exactly the same thing. I uh, just need to keep track of more indices. I take the log, um, then I will differentiate, equate to 0, and I will get theta, and I will get pi.
All right, so that's my log likelihood. Let's first estimate pi. Actually, let's, uh, let's start with uh, theta, because theta is a familiar term. Actually, I did realize I went very slow today, so I've run out of time. Um, here's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to compute the log that we're going to take the derivative of this term and we're going to estimate pi and we're going to estimate um, theta. I'm going to ask you as an exercise, and this really will help with me presenting this material. So I've noticed sort of how faces seem to be lost and I think they're lost because of keeping track of the indices because this material is not new and judging by the exam you actually knew the Bernoulli distribution pretty well. So what I'm going to ask you is to Go home, I will put this online, and you will derive the maximum likelihood estimator of pi and the maximum likelihood of theta. And if you try that for the next class, when I do this in the next class, it will go a lot quicker and we'll get these estimates. Okay, and then we'll do the Bayesian analysis, try a likelihood, and we'll be done. We'll have the solution for the naive base. Once you know that, you can go and implement your own sentiment engine on the web. Um. I'll take your question off. Shouldn't that be c equal to 1 to c in the second term? Uh, oh yeah, I call this nc. Thank you. Um, for the midterm, to hand it back, I'm going to split them. They sorted by surname, and so So I'm going to, all right, before you guys pick it up, let me make sure this will minimize the amount of problems here. There will be two piles there, A to G and then H to N. And then Oz over here. <laughs> no, sorry, we can update the website. Thank you. 